26 hours in three planes, a jeep, a hydrofoil, and now this little canoe, and I'm finally reaching Saram, home to the most feared headhunters of the Spice Islands. For over 200 years, the Dutch ran these islands and tried to pacify the warrior peoples of the jungle interior. The Nawalu, were the last to stop taking the heads of their victims. I land with some trepidation. The Nuwalu have a fearsome reputation and a rich and complex view of the world that effectively excludes outsiders. Guests are not usually welcomed into their jungle home. But they're proud of their skills and have agreed to teach me how they hunt, trap, and survive in this remote area of rainforest. Without a chief, I'm not quite sure what sort of a reception I'll get. Rivers are the arteries of the jungle. If you're lost, the best way to get out is to follow them downstream and hope that you make it to a native village. I'm doing that in reverse, heading into the rainforest to where the Nuwalu have their settlements. When you think of jungle, your mind has a habit of focusing on snakes and on large dangerous animals. But in reality, the two most dangerous things in any jungle are the insects that bring disease and the people. This triangle is a warning sign, just like our road triangles. And it's left here by the Nawalu people to warn me that if I stray from either side of the path, I may fall victim to one of their deer traps that could just as easily kill me. The Nawalu are renowned for their hunting skills. They are masters of animal trapping. Here's one of those traps that signpost earlier on was warning me of. There's an animal trail here, it looks like jungle pig, and above it is a tripwire. And that leads down to the trigger, which is set very finely just here. And of course, once that's set off, this spear is thrown straight through the pig by that springy arm. It seems incredible that with just a few sticks and rattan, the jungle string, you can make such a lethal trap. The Nuwalu employ many sorts of traps depending on the terrain and the kind of animal they're after. Every action in the forest requires respect to the ancestral spirits that dwell here. To ensure the success of the traps, the Nawalu make an offering to their ancestors. If they don't, they believe bad luck will befall them. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Having been accepted, I return with Saiti, the younger brother of the imprisoned chief, to their permanent village. 
The houses, like most in this region, are built on stilts to withstand the heavy monsoon rains. During a month, if things go well, I will catch one or two deer with a spear trap and maybe two or three pigs with a rope trap. I will always give an offering to the ancestor of my clan, the Samori, who is the python. Otherwise, we would have no more kills. The Nuwalu are divided into five clans and believe each one was created by an animal ancestor. The Nipani clan have the couscous as theirs, so they'll never eat one. To do so would be like eating their grandmother. Ancestors are revered, and shamans like Raja Penang contact them for help and advice. At the beginning of the world, our animal ancestors taught us how to hunt. They help us chase away evil spirits and sickness. You Europeans have the sago tree as your ancestor. He taught you nothing of the forest, but gave you tools, like knives, to trade with us. Son here is sharpening the most important tool that any Nuwalu has, his parang. And with this, he can fashion almost anything that he needs from the jungle. With a parang in your hand, you can find food, water, and make a temporary shelter. The great thing about the rainforest is that everything you need to build a shelter is here. The sago palm provides the roof, while bamboo, the main structure. Light, strong, and easy to shape, bamboo is a fantastically versatile building material. A few chops, and you have the classic A-frame of a Nualu hunting lodge. The leaf of the sago palm is strong and waterproof. Individual fronds can be stitched together with a sliver of string made from the central rib. The classic jungle knot is a simple twist and tuck. Within half an hour, the roof is complete, which is just as well. They get over three meters of rain a year. think that jungles are full of water, but of course not all of it's safe to drink. This on the other hand is, it's the water vine. I've cut this section bottom then top, and this is packed with water. Refreshing, even on the hottest day. Collecting food is strictly divided between the sexes. Only men can hunt the larger animals, which often entails leaving the village for a week or more. The women forage closer to home. This fishing basket is beautifully woven from bamboo, using an old basket as a frame. I think I'm doing all right, but I'm nowhere near as fast as the women. You've got to have nimble fingers for this job. Of course, the only problem with having to learn from the women all the time is you've got to put up with all their bickering. <laughs> I haven't broken it yet. Yeah. 
This environment is so productive that there's an easy meal to be had almost everywhere. This river is teeming with life. Can I have a look? Let's see what they've got in their baskets. They've got a crab. There are also shrimps and little fish in here. It's incredible. There's a meal to be had here really easily, as long as you've got the right tool. For that, they're using this basket made from a single piece of bamboo. And of course, if you've got bamboo, you've also got the means to make a fire and a cooking pot to cook your meal. There's the cooking pot, nice tube, all ready to go. They put the prawns in the tube with some water and now they've stuffed it with manioc leaves to cook with it. And an extra big watch just to finish off with to seal in the steam. Ingenious. Another astounding use is flooring, both for hunting lodges and the houses in the village. Split and spread flat, it takes only a few big bamboo to make a raised floor to protect you from the jungle nasties and the damp. Smooth and springy, it will last for years. To make fire, what I need is some dry bamboo like this. And on this piece of bamboo, I have to cut a notch. This piece of bamboo needs to be sharpened up because this is going to make a soaring edge to work onto that bamboo like that. Dead bamboo like this is the perfect tinder provider. Bamboo has like a varnish coating on it which keeps out moisture. You, you remove that varnish, and these wood fibers here are dry. And we can make that into two little tinder bundles by scraping. I'm going to take this tinder and put that on the inside of the hole in two small bundles. And to hold that in place, we're going to need just one more piece of bamboo, which we'll split and break so that it holds it without crushing it. Now we're ready to make fire. Neat trick. And with fire, you can cook your prawns in that bamboo steamer. You know, a meal like this sort of epitomizes survival. You start out with the right resource, in this case bamboo, you couple that with a bit of knowledge, and at the end you get the reward. Beautiful jungle shrimp. Enak. Enak. Yeah. <laughs>
Trapping may seem very hit or miss, but actually it's not. The Nuala have caught this pig and they want to keep him alive. You can see he's pretty distressed and angry. Taking a pig out of a trap alive is a very dangerous thing. So I'm going to stay well out of the way and let them get on with it. They want to take it back to the village to fatten it up, which is how wild animals first became domesticated. Nualu set traps all over their forest, so they must travel for hours to check whether they've been successful. It's very hot, humid and gruelling work, not without its dangers. Most of the wild animals they catch end up like this pig, dead. The fat and crackling from the pig are highly prized. This is a quick and easy way to singe the hair off in preparation for cooking, using dry sago leaves. Some banana leaves make a butcher's table. Another tube of bamboo is the cooking pot. And midrib of sago leaf for tongs. While the pig is cooking, Sanjali and Matoki head off into the night to see what else they can find to cook. The nocturnal couscous is a reliable source of meat for everyone except the Nipani clan. Plentiful, very tasty, and luckily, a bit slow. <laughs> The Nawalu are great opportunists when it comes to feeding themselves. A cave means bats, and bats, while small, are numerous and relatively simple to catch. Just knock them down while they're asleep. So pig, couscous and bat. That's a lot of protein for very little effort. Enak. Enak. I don't know about you, but I don't think they're as fierce as their reputation. And this jungle pork, simply delicious. Mm. But the jungle is as deceptive as the Nawawi. It can be a veritable supermarket of food. But if you don't know what you're doing, dangers lurk everywhere. It's claustrophobic, easy to get lost in, and many of the plants are poisonous. Even those that are edible pose other problems. You may think the fruit in the forest is freely available, but that's not always the case. Sometimes trees are in ownership, and markers like this are put up to remind you of that. 
fact, I think the message this one conveys is pretty clear. The Nawalu don't take kindly to fruit theft. So what's all the fuss about? Well, this is the durian tree. And down here is its fabled fruit. Believe it or not, a tree of this size can produce up to a thousand of these. And when they're perfectly ripe, they start to split open like this one here. Now, at this stage, they start to honk a bit. In fact, somebody described it as smelling like a cross between carrion and vomit, which isn't far off the case. But if you split that open, in here are the seeds, and they're covered in the fruit itself. Mm. It's quite heavenly. And, that, and the bit you eat is the creamy substance that surrounds the seed. Mm. Without question, the most important tree to the Nawalu is the sago palm. It not only provides the raw material for their homes, but is also their staple food. Remember what I said about those insects? You've got to keep your eyes open. <laughs> of course, some insects provide a tasty snack. I'm really impressed. These guys are putting their hands into an unsmoked bee's nest and pulling out honey. But frankly, you've got to draw the line somewhere. And my tooth just isn't that sweet. The inner core of the sago tree is packed with starch, but it's too woody to eat raw. So generations of Nualu have perfected a processing system made out of the tree itself. The base of the tree makes a hod as well as a system of basins and sluices into which water is poured to release the starch from the pith. A piece of coconut fibre is secured with some more pieces of sago to act as a sieve. The mixture is now allowed to sit in the basin and the starch will settle to the bottom. But this is the most ingenious bit. Sago fronds also make the carrying pot. I didn't even attempt it. Once the water is released, the sago is ready to be packed and taken home. Four trees will feed a family for a year. Cooking it couldn't be easier. Just add boiling water. This is the paste from the sago plant. It looks like wallpaper paste and it probably tastes like it. But fortunately, I don't have to taste it because according to Nawalu tradition, I came from a sago tree. And so this is one of my ancestors and I'm not supposed to eat it. <laughs> the marvellous thing about the sago palm is that it goes on producing food long after it's dead when it becomes the home to these little beauties, palm grubs, which they tell me are a local delicacy. Bagus, bagus. <laughs> Break it open. Ah, like that. Bagus. Bagus. Yeah. Sort of. Come <laughs> on. <laughs>
The jungle is a wonderfully rich source of food and shelter, but it can just as easily provide clothing as well. A strip of bark from the sapani tree, soaked and hammered flat, becomes a bark cloth. Until very recently, this was the only clothing Anwalu would wear. It's now used almost exclusively for the ritual of male initiation. In a secluded area, away from the women, the initiates are dressed in the regalia of manhood. A loincloth of bark and the red headscarves is symbolic of Nawalu bravery. For these boys, it's a big day. It marks their arrival into manhood. And for the future of the Nawalu, it's crucial. Rituals like this keep their sense of community and pride intact and their culture alive. The elders will teach the boys all the skills of the forest, how to make shelters, how to trap animals, and which trees give the best resin for burning in the ceremonial torches, the only form of light sanctioned by the ancestors for use in rituals. The Nualu are well aware of the modern world. They trade food for metal to make their parangs and for the treasured red cloth. And they hope to keep their culture alive as their ancestors would wish. At the beginning of the world, the ancestors taught us everything we need to live in the forest. We must respect their wishes and continue to teach our children those ways so that they will understand the forest and be able to live here forever, or until the world ends. Like all of the places I've been to in this series, the jungle is a harsh environment. But once you take the time to see it through the eyes of the native inhabitants, people like the Nualu, you begin to realize that not only can you survive here, but you can also enjoy the experience. Of course, the secret is in knowing how. Many of the skills we've seen have taken thousands of years to acquire. If we're not careful, we could lose them in only a couple of generations. I'm a demon.